Welcome back, guys, to the JPS podcast. And in today's episode, I'm honored to have Danny Lennon from Sigma Nutrition Radio on the show. And there is no video in this episode as we recorded this one, Sigma style, uh, so audio only, guys. But in today's discussion, I'm sure this is a topic that will be quite new to many of you, but very, very interesting. And we discussed circadian eating, which was Danny's topic at the UABC on the weekend just gone. So we talk about the central and peripheral body clocks that the body has and how that might affect our eating and the way that we structure our diet from the timing of our meals, the calorie distribution throughout the day, our consistency within our nutritional habits, as well as our feeding and fasting cycle. So I hope you enjoy this episode of the JPS podcast. If you do, be sure to like it and drop a comment. All right, guys, welcome back to the JPS podcast. And today we have Danny Lennon here at JPS. No video today because we are recording Sigma Nutrition Radio style, so audio only. I hope you guys uh, are grateful for that. You're not going to have Danny's weathered face on screen, um, but it would have been very entertaining. Danny, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. I've never felt better. That is a lie. <laughs> No, but I'm very uh, grateful to have Danny on. He presented on the weekend at the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference here in Melbourne on circadian eating and evaluating the impact of meal timing, feeding windows, and calorie distribution. I'm going to be talking about that today. And unfortunately, I didn't get to see Danny's presentation because because I had to run out and do some powerlifting. But uh, hopefully, I'll get a little bit more of an insight into the topic today, and I can share that with you guys. So firstly, Danny, what is circadian biology? Yeah, so there's essentially a branch of, bio of biology called chronobiology, which looks at uh, these various different phenomena and biological processes that have a time-based component or run in some sort of pattern. And so a lot of these rhythms can be have a, like a, a time period that are, is quite short, some are very long. So for example, one thing people are familiar with is that on a regular rhythm or regu regular cycle, animals hibernate and then have periods of wakefulness, right? So that's something that has this long time frame. The area of circadian biology is a specific branch of chronobiology, which concerns about these rhythms that have kind of two main components. So one is that they run at about a 24 hour kind of rhythm. So it kind of re that same rhythm will repeat every 24 hours ish and we'll surely get to that and the second thing that makes something circadian is that while it's repeating on a daily cycle that is a property that's kind of intrinsic to that process so in other words nothing externally is what's leading to it being around 24 hours if you were to have that cell isolated somewhere with no light or temperature or anything like that externally acting on it it would still have this pattern of about 24 hours so that's these rhythms are kind of where we talk about with circadian biology. And there's a few other elements that I'm sure we'll get to about setting rhythms and stuff like that. But one of the kind of things that make uh, what we do in our behaviors, and that's including our eating, as I'm sure we'll come to, our different behaviors, how they influence our circadian rhythms, is that we use external stimuli within our environment to help fine tune or tweak or what we refer to as entrainment of these rhythms to a more precise 24 hour cycle. So as I said, these uh, biological processes, uh, for example, that could be uh, to give people an example of what a circadian rhythm uh, could, could, where it could occur, something like your core body temperature has a same pattern that repeats from day to day. It slightly increases over the day, peaks at maybe around 4 or 5 p.m., drops back down, and you'll have like a minimal core body temperature during the night, which helps with sleep. Uh, similarly, we have hormones, uh, one important one being melatonin, that will be fairly low throughout the day and will start to gradually uh, increase uh, as we get towards uh, nighttime. And a, a few hours before sleep, it'll rise and pass a certain threshold threshold to help with uh, sleep. At least that's one of its functions in a healthy person. So we have these different circadian rhythms. And whilst uh, if we think that as an average, a lot of people would have some uh, a rhythm that isn't running exactly 24 hours, right? So if they were left to their own devices, like I said earlier. So what we do is because our day is 24 hours, we want that to match up with a 
we can use things like our light exposure, temperature, and so on for our body to set those rhythms more precisely. So the main thing that will regulate our main circadian clock and our main uh, circadian uh, rhythms will be exposure to light and dark. So light early in the day, ideally, darkness at night, that is a way for our body to detect when it's light, when it's dark, and when these rhythms should be running. So we can now kind of fine tune those rhythms that left to our own devices may run a bit longer than 24 hours on average, and we can get it more in line with that 24 hour process, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. So it sounds like our exposure to external stimuli can largely influence these internal uh, systems that are operating at a biological level. And it's probably a wise idea to start designing our lifestyle uh, in a way that it's conducive to a biological function. Is that, right. is that correct? So that kind of gets us to this concept of circadian alignment and circadian misalignment. So in circadian alignment, we have our uh, circadian rhythms that are set by our central or main master clock. Um, and, but we also have circadian clocks in all tissues around the body. And so we want those things to be synchronized or running uh, as they should in alignment, hence the term circadian alignment. And so our behaviors need to be aligned with these kind of processes or how we'd want them to run. If we do, if we have a certain behavior that causes a shift in some of these uh, circadian rhythms, we can cause circadian misalignment. So for example, our main regulator of these rhythms is light exposure, as I just said. So if you, uh, a, a common one people will think of is if you give someone a lot of bright blue light exposure at night, that's in conflict with what we'd want. So that can cause a shift in some of these circadian rhythms, can cause circadian misalignment. It's also sometimes referred to as chrono disruption. And now we have this kind of out of sync circadian uh, pattern and that's associated with all sorts of different metabolic dysfunction and so on so yeah we want to look at what things impact these different rhythms and what way should we set up our environment and our lifestyle to kind of maximize circadian alignment and avoid circadian misalignment fantastic and it sounds like a very important factor in achieving circadian alignment is our exposure to light so is there an order of priorities in terms of which factors we need to address before we can align our circadian uh, rhythms a little bit better. Um, for example, if we just focused on something that might not be as pivotal to, uh, to our circadian rhythms as uh, sleep and uh, sunlight exposure, uh, such as our meal timing, would that be jumping the gun to just start focusing on that before you get the sleep dialed in? Right. Yeah, that's a really important point. So uh, a good way to kind of conceptualize this is uh, as I kind of briefly mentioned on, but should probably explain a bit more, we have this main central circadian clock that's located in the brain. So it's something called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or the SCN. It's located in the hypothalamus of the brain, and that's the main things that sets most of our circadian rhythms for things like body temperature, melatonin, and various other things. That that also will set circadian rhythms in these other circadian clocks that are located all around the body. So whilst most people know that we have some sort of body clock and they'll say, oh, when I travel across time zones, my body clock is a bit off. We don't really have just one, right? We have this main central one, but now there's these circadian clocks in all tissues around our body. These are called peripheral clocks. So they can be also influenced and set by that master clock, but they can also be influenced by some of the things like feeding, exercise, sleep, um, jet lag, things like that. Now, like you said, right before we start worrying about how does our meal timing influence uh, potentially some of these peripheral clocks, we need to say, well, when are we getting light and dark exposure? When are we sleeping and waking? Because they're going to have a much larger impact on this kind of whole circadian biology piece. And when we have that down, then we can start factoring in how do we match up our feeding and fasting times mm -hmm. with that. So yeah, you're kind of, you're, you are jumping the gun if you start worrying about meal timing, but yet you have lots of bright light exposure at night. If you are, for example, if uh, this is common with people who do shift work or people who don't get daylight uh, during the day, things like that, people who have chronically s sleep restriction. So those things are probably where we'd start from a circadian perspective. And then we can start asking more of these interesting questions about, well, how does meal timing, if any, play a role and how do we kind of match these different cycles up? Awesome. That was a, a brilliant explanation. So assuming somebody has dialed in their sunlight exposure and they're getting 
regular, consistent and adequate sleep, um, what is then the role of meal timing on these circadian rhythms? Yeah, so this has kind of really brought a interesting area of research to the fore in the last few years, uh, an area referred to as chrononutrition, which is, again, based on circadian biology, but thinking about uh, how does meal timing and where we place those nutrients across the day potentially influence our health via circadian impacts. And this idea comes about because we know that when we consume nutrients, that can entrain or set these peripheral uh, circadian clocks. So not that central clock, it seems to be sp uh, specifically in different peripheral clocks located around the body. So that could be in uh, muscle tissue, it's in the intestine, like all tissues around the body typically have uh, these different peripheral clocks. And so if we know that feeding can entrain some of these rhythms there, and we've already said we want circadian alignment, so we want, say, those rhythms set by the master clock to be synced up with those in the peripheral clock, then it makes sense then well, maybe there are some better times to consume nutrients. And keeping with that line of thought, the hypothesis would be that during the day, we that's when we want light exposure. During the night, we want dark exposure. During the day and that light exposure, we should also probably push most of our calories and avoid eating later at night to, again, sink in with this thing. The same way that we would want to be restful during the night and have our activity during the day when it's bright. And so kind of syncing up these different cycles so that we're kind of maximizing that effect or that's at least the hypothesis um still quite new in terms of how many like well-controlled uh human trials we have that can really answer a lot of the specific questions that we're trying to but there's plenty that i think starts to suggest there is something to this and that was kind of the idea of the talk to present here are some different areas of research that may suggest there's something to it and so the way i tried to outline it was we can look at observationally different things we notice within the research we can then look at mechanistically is there any rationale that would make sense that we see differences in either metabolic health or maybe even body composition by eating at different times then look at some of the animal data and then look at human trials uh, most notably in the area of time restricted feeding or time restricted eating which has become quite popular recently um, and it's actually slightly different from intermittent fasting, which we'll probably get to. And in all these different areas of research, what are we kind of seeing? And is it painting us a picture of what's going on? Awesome. And in terms of uh, meal frequency, we obviously want to distribute some ca more calories towards the time of day when we're exposed to sunlight. Um, but what is the overall picture mechanistically and from observations that we're seeing in terms of guidelines for people around how many meals they should have per day mm. and during what times? Yeah, so this kind of gets a bit tricky, but I think one of the things that we know, and I'm sure you've probably discussed on the show before, is that there's no magical meal frequency per se, and that if you're matching for calories and macronutrients, it probably doesn't matter if that person prefers three big meals, six small meals, or so on. And I think that's a pretty um, uncontroversial statement. I think I don't think there's a magical meal frequency that people need to have. So when it comes to meal frequency, I think the only thing that I talked about from this kind of circadian perspective is it probably doesn't matter the exact number of meals, but it more matters the consistency of that. So we have this idea of erratic eating, which you see is quite common in most of the general population. There was a few studies that I mentioned that look at this. And by this erratic eating, we're seeing that from day to day, people have dramatically different meal frequencies. When they have those meals is dramatically different. And so that constant kind of changing in those is probably not a good thing. So having a more consistent or regular pattern either to the number of meals and when they are consumed is uh, at least, uh, theoretically would make a lot of sense and can be beneficial. So there was one good study that looked at this, um, came out of the UK. The author was Al Hussein, and they looked at a what they call a regular feeding pattern. So it was a two-week study where the regular feeding pattern was three main meals and three snacks. Um, and they did that every day, same time for those two weeks. And then they had an irregular feeding pattern where the other condition was anywhere between three and nine meals per day and it changed every single day across the 14 days of the study. So day one could be three meals, next day was eight meals, next day was four, then it was nine, then it was eight, then it was two, or uh, not two, uh, four, and keep switching between three and nine meals every day for these two weeks. 
And what you see there was differences by the end of the study in their uh, glucose tolerance, uh, insulin sensitivity, some glycemic markers like that, which again would suggest for optimal metabolic health, it might be a good idea to have a regular meal timing and consistent and not just erratic eating at, at random times and different amounts from day to day, which is, is quite common, I think, for most people. Yeah, definitely. And uh, from a hunger and satiety standpoint, is there any implications on this meal consistency on the regulation of appetite? Uh, potentially. They didn't look at that directly in the Al Hussein study. Um, uh, so I don't know if we had actually see that um, directly just from a changing of, of meal frequency like that. Where we do see changes um, and benefits potentially for appetite is this other area that I discussed of where across the day to place most of those calories. So one of the things that potentially from a circadian perspective makes sense is to avoid eating late at night for sure and definitely during the night. So we see people that eat during the night or in the early hours of the morning, how you metabolize that meal is very different from if you had it during the day. So your uh, postprandial glucose, so how high your blood glucose goes and stays in that kind of few hours after eating is much worse at night. You see same things with insulin sensitivity is a lot worse uh, at night. And in fact, insulin sensitivity starts at its highest in the morning and just declines throughout the day. And so we know eating late at night is problematic. And then again, because of that change in things like insulin sensitivity across the day, there's this idea that maybe partitioning more of our calories or at least biasing more of them earlier can be beneficial. Uh, there's a few reasons to that, which I'll come back to, but specifically on the satiety piece, there's been a couple of those studies that have showed that for the same number of calories and macros in say three meals across the day, you can see differences in uh, things like leptin and ghrelin potentially if more of them are biased earlier in the day. Uh, so that could suggest that for some people at least, it could help them comply with that diet or feel less hungry whilst dieting if they were partitioning it earlier in the day. Um, how many or, or if that's for everyone is probably unlikely, uh, but that would be the only thing that comes to mind on the satiety piece. So basically no more rapid backloading and intermittent fasting. <laughs> that, that's we're now front, one of the We're things. now front loading. So, <laughs> the, so the kind of punchline that I kind of finished the talk on was that there's lots of interesting stuff that I think there's a lot of merit to with this chrononutrition piece. I think it could be very beneficial for people. But whilst we're still, there's lots of questions that still remain, there's lots of things that are we're quite early and trying to work out. And I'm certainly not saying this is the way anyone needs to eat. Don't do any of this stuff if it leads to um, it, you undermining the kind of core fundamental pieces that uh, we know work, right? So if it makes it more difficult for you to do, if it conflicts too much with a work schedule and you can't eat at these times, if you don't feel better doing it, right? If it, you, if it's harder for you to eat the number of calories you need to, then these things are undermining those fundamental pieces. So not a good idea. But all other things being equal, I think I can make a, a decent, or at least we can propose or give a hypothesis of why if you put more of your calories slightly earlier, you could see some benefits. Um, so for example, uh, one of the things you see quite consistent in time-restricted feeding models um, and, and with early time-restricted feeding as well is that when you restrict that feeding window, people tend to eat less calories. Uh, maybe not that surprising, but you also see things like when more of the calories are biased earlier in the day, people's energy expenditure across the day increases. So there's been a few studies that have pretty consistently shown this. Um, different me mechanisms by which this may be happening. One is diet-induced thermogenesis tends to be higher in the morning than the evening. So what this means is when you eat a meal, you use a certain amount of calories to digest that. And for the same meal given morning or in the evening, that number can be slightly different. And actually, at least to one study, there can be quite a large difference, uh, over 40% in that between morning and evening time. Uh, the other one is the potential for indirectly, if it influences how, acti how, how active people are throughout the day, that could influence your energy expenditure. Um, one good example here, there was a uh, breakfast study done in Bath by James Betts, was the lead author on it. They actually did two studies like this, but w one of them particularly looked at what happens when we either have a group 
skip breakfast and have their first meal at 12, or the other group has a large breakfast of about 700 calories. And so in that condition, they saw that the group that had a 700 calorie breakfast ate more calories, but they didn't gain any more weight than the other group. So what was happening was their energy expenditure was ramping up across the day. And specifically, it's both, it was that diet-induced thermogenesis increased and also their physical activity thermogenesis, so just how many calories they're using from being physically active. So at least potentially here, we're seeing a model of where when those meals are consumed would influence people's energy expenditure. Um, so that kind of gives an idea of where some of that is coming from. There's a couple of other cool studies uh, that look at kind of the calorie distribution thing. Uh, one kind of cool one was done by Daniel Yakubovich. Uh, she is a researcher at Tel Aviv. And they looked at a large breakfast versus large dinner study. So they had a, it was a dieting condition where they were dieting on 1,400 calories per day. They matched macros between both groups. And they just differed on what the size of the breakfast and dinner was. So the large breakfast group had a 700 calorie breakfast, 500 calorie lunch, 200 calorie dinner. Large dinner group had the opposite. They had 200 calories at breakfast, 500 calories at lunch, and a 700 calorie dinner. And in that study, uh, you see there was a pretty dramatic difference in weight loss between two groups. I think off the top of my head, it was something like maybe 8.6 kilos in the large breakfast group compared to like 3.6 in the large dinner. Uh, you see big differences in waist circumference change. Uh, there was differences in uh, their blood glucose, uh, fasting insulin, things like that. Definitely at the end of the study, which would make sense because they lost more weight. But also they measured that stuff at the start of week two of the study before there was any weight loss differences. And you just saw there was better glycemic control and postprandial glucose response in the large breakfast group. So that would, again, limitations with that study, um, given the like the number of people and, and some other things, how well controlled the, the number of calories were. So it wasn't a metabolic ward study or they weren't giving people the food in this particular one. They did in a couple of follow-up studies actually. But uh, so those things could influence why we saw such dramatic changes because I don't think uh, we would see them just from an increased energy expenditure. Uh, but at least shows that something is happening uh, when we change meal timing that maybe should make us pause and think, uh, well, when we say that as long as your macros across the day are the same, it doesn't really matter. It's like, largely that's a good point because most people worry too much about this stuff um, and they can still eat at whatever time they want and still put themselves in this deficit and still lose body fat. That's all 100% still true. But this is kind of getting us to think critically of, well, maybe for some people, and we want to look at some of this metabolic health stuff, maybe it could be a good idea to be mindful of where most of our calories are put, or at least how late in the day we end up eating, um, especially if it's like a large meal right late at night before bed, might not be the best idea based on some of these things. So breakfast is the most important meal of the day, don't you? <laughs> No, <laughs> I will not go that far to say that. Yeah, so that's the kind of thing that when... Uh, Another thing with this uh, kind of circadian idea is that it make as I said, if we go with the premise that it makes sense to try and line up feeding with kind of like that daylight exposure when we're awake, you'd probably think, well, I should probably consume some nutrients in the early part of the day. Now, the questions we don't have an answer to is, well, how early does it need to be? How soon after waking? Does it make that much difference? So what I would say is I don't really know. I don't think people need to have breakfast in like the traditional way that we think of it as like as soon as you get up go and have a breakfast it can probably in those first number of hours perhaps but it makes some sense that in the early part of the day to get some of those nutrients and maybe try and not be super heavy in the caloric load of the very final meal and try not to have that like super late at night um so yeah no that was that was very interesting and i and i totally agree that we often miss the forest for the trees with nutrition when we think that energy balance and calories and macros are the only things that matter, uh, especially from a health perspective. So I think this just, uh, yeah, changes the lens at which we look through nutrition, which is always a good idea. And you mentioned earlier that insulin sensitivity is a little bit higher in the morning, drops off throughout the day and is lowest in the evening. How does exercise and activity influence uh, 
uh, the circadian rhythms and the alignments of them from our central, you know, uh, bi biological perspective, and then uh, the synchronization of both nutritional related circadian rhythms with uh, those affected by exercise. Yeah, so that there's a few components to this that I'd, I'll mention about exercise. So one is that we do see a similar uh, kind of observation within some of the, the, the research that exercise and activity can influence some of those peripheral clocks and entrainment in some of those. Um, I'm not as familiar with the exercise and circadian research as on the nutrition side, but you could probably make... Shocker. It, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> I know nothing about training. Um, but you could... Again, some of the things we see, I mentioned earlier, uh, body temperature and how it changes across the day. And we see this kind of peak in um, like 4 or 5 p.m. on average. That's kind of some of the reasoning why uh, you probably would have seen people recommend, oh, there's an optimal training time. It's like this late afternoon uh, timing is where you might get best performance. And some of that at least is kind of rooted in some of these processes that are regulated by uh, circadian rhythms like body temperature. The idea with your body temperature is higher, more ready to train, et cetera. For, and then there's some other reasons people give too. So there's there's something potentially to that. But the, the main thing I would like to talk about with um, exercise, and actually goes back to what you said at the very start of the question, which is where I, th I thought you were going, was we see this decrease in insulin sensitivity across the day, which means you're essentially becoming more insulin resistant as the day goes on. So that would suggest, well, maybe having carbohydrates at night is not a good idea. We should avoid them, only have carbs in the morning, and so on. At least people might jump to that conclusion. One thing that I, I mentioned at the, the presentation was exercise and training, and particularly resistance training, kind of changes that. Because one thing, and I haven't seen this uh, looked at in a circadian sense, but one thing we see uh, separately is that when you have resistance training and muscle contraction, you see the movement of certain glucose transporters from the center of a cell, uh, a muscle cell, to the surface of the cell. These are called GLUT4 transporters. And the significance of this is that usually for glucose to move from our bloodstream into a, a, a muscle cell, for example, we use insulin. That's kind of one of its functions. It comes along, attaches to an insulin receptor, and allows glucose to move into a specific cell by getting these glucose transporters working. Now, the thing with this muscle contraction and the movement of these GLUT4 transporters is that this can allow for glucose disposal or that movement of glucose into a muscle cell without insulin. So it's, it's called a, a non-insulin mediated process or an insulin independent process. And so now it, if you've just lifted some weights, for example, or done some other uh, type of exercise, you can probably ha deal with that carbohydrate load in the evening time without worrying that you're essentially a bit more insulin resistant at the level of the muscle because you don't need that insulin sensitivity to allow for that glucose disposal. So I do think training uh, changes things quite a bit. I think that'd be a cool area of research to investigate, um, at least from the glucose response and a um, kind of training insulin kind of perspective. Now, there could be some other things why eating large meals at night may be different, but that's one thing. Um, and then, as, as I'll probably come to, that there's some other caveats of where worrying about these things is probably not beneficial if we have an athlete and they have a, a specific goal and their number one goal is athletic performance then we're probably going to set up their nutrition in a way that maximizes recovery and performance and not so worry too much about what is their acute postprandial glucose response to this meal in the evening right yeah that, that was essentially the question that i was alluding to and how the interplay between nutrition and exercise um could potentially yeah alter uh, insulin and the feeding, uh, the distribution of calories across the day. Um, no, but that's very interesting. So I guess, yeah, let's talk about some of the caveats to this whole circadian rhythm uh, approach, uh, when we should focus on it. We've kind of touched on that, but you know, who it might not be necessary to prioritize for, um, and then some of the limitations, I guess, and things we need to know a little bit more about. Yeah, sure. So just before getting to that, I should probably mention that kind of the main, um, let's say poster child of this, uh, line of research has kind of turned into being time restricted feeding, um, which is, has a ton of animal data behind. 
And I mentioned animal data briefly in the presentation, not because many people tend to be convinced by animal data, and rightly so, there are, there's some lots of things that don't translate to humans, but the, the, at least in this area, the thing I find most interesting is that the consistency of the direction it goes is that pretty much every time-restricted feeding model you see done when, in rodents, they just benefit from it in every different type of marker people look at. And so it's incredibly consistent of the benefits there. Um, in the human data, there's been some really cool trials done, and we can certainly circle back to them. But just to give people some idea, time-restricted feeding is essentially restricting uh, meals to within a certain window of time. So most commonly it's been looked at in like an eight hour eating window, but that we still don't know what is the best window to eat, but it essentially restricted down from when people would normally eat. And at least some papers that have came up, Sachin Panda's lab would suggest a lot of people in the general population have something like a 15 hour eating window where they're eating soon after getting up in the morning, they're consuming some sort of uh, calories or nutrients late in the evening before bed. And so they're consistently eating throughout the day. And so simply moving that to a restriction of you can eat between these times seems to be uh, potentially very beneficial uh, for a few reasons. One, it can maybe alter how much people are gonna consume, but also it seems to have some impacts on some of the, those glycemic markers I mentioned too. Um, so I think the way I tried to say, okay, this is interesting, there's some cool stuff here, but there's obviously some contraindications that would stop me from saying, hey, everyone needs to go and have like this time-restricted feeding um, where they have a, a restricted feeding window. And we also want to put that early in the day based on these hypothetical things. I don't think we're there yet, but I also think there's some contraindications. For example, with, um, I mentioned a couple already. One is uh, training. So when people are actually going to be doing some exercise, that kind of changes the need for this. Two is when you're working with athletes. So... Uh, for example, I've worked with a lot of athletes that train like twice a day. Their main goal in life is performance. And so moving to a restricted feeding window or any of these types of things I've mentioned may be suboptimal for that if they're trying to re recover and uh, fuel for different training sessions as their main goal. That may not be the best idea. Uh, similarly, a lot of them can have very high calorie demands. I'm sure you've had plenty of guys in the gym who struggle to eat enough calories as it already is. And now something like this could make that more difficult. So people trying to gain weight, trying to eat more, then this may be kind of counterproductive. Um, it's easy to think of other examples of that, whether that's uh, people who are, like, you see some Olympic athletes like swimmers, they might need like 8,000 calories a day. Giving them a six hour feeding window doesn't really make much sense. Um, it could be someone who is generally under eating, could be a pregnant woman, it could be a number of different people. Uh, the other two are more kind of pragmatic. So that these caveats I mentioned was one about social occasions. And so, for example, if they're like when we go for a meal the other night after the conference, I'm not going to say, hey, it's like nine o'clock. I'm not eating now. I, I finish eating at five. Right. When it's 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 more about in general, you can eat a certain way, but don't let that stop you from things that are still important in life that still influence your health in certain ways. So um, I would just be, again, that would be something where I think it's pretty acceptable to break some of these rules and have a lot of calories late in the evening if you're going out for a meal mm -hmm. with family or friends. Um, and then the kind of final one is if any of these types of eating strategies make it uh a lot of hassle for someone to follow, if they find it difficult to do, if it uh, makes them feel more anxious about nutrition or whatever, it makes life more stressful, then it's undermining the things that we should be helping them with. And so if it makes it more difficult for them just to generally eat healthy in the appropriate amounts, or it makes it just uh, a scheduling nightmare, or it just makes them stressed out, then I would say, yeah, it's probably contraindicated. So there are a few examples of where we should maybe be wary of recommending these types of strategies. Fantastic. And I think uh, we had a discussion over the weekend about potentially putting up your presentation on YouTube to uh, let everybody have an insight into the entire topic and what it's all about. And uh, we plan on doing that. There's awesome. going to be a little bit of a catch though, I think. Uh, we've got to get some shares on this podcast here That's to uh, raise some awareness around it. If we uh, 
tick a few milestones, I think we'll put it up for free. So, yeah, Danny, is there anything else uh, you wanted to add about the circadian rhythm? I think we covered very broadly the nuts and bolts. Mm. Um, one thing, yeah, that I, I do want to, I think is important to reinforce and I've, I've kind of alluded to it, but just to make it really clear to people, um, because I think when people first hear this, they may have a initial reaction one way or the other. Um, I am very much in terms of what I think we can actually confidently conclude right now, there's only a few things. So like I said, it probably is a good idea to uh, think about when you're getting light and dark exposure. I think it's a good idea to probably try not to eat very late at night. I think it's a good idea to have ideally uh, eating patterns that are not erratic in nature. And I think if it's uh, no, uh, for a lot of people, they may find it beneficial to just have a restricted feeding window. Now the question is how long does that be? I've, we have no idea if, if eight is better than seven or if nine or 10 is okay or six, need, like we still need to work that out. But it seems a very simple intervention for a lot of people, particularly in the, like, the general population, to have a restricted feeding window um, that may be of benefit. Uh, probably in the first number of hours across the day, again, we don't know how many, it might be a good idea to have some sort of nutrient ingestion and maybe just not have a, a lot of calories at, late at night. Um, beyond that, the rest is just still a lot of questions up in the air. And I kind of put this stuff more out of like, this is interesting. I think there's a lot of stuff to this. To some degree, you could say like the writing is on the wall for a lot of it, but we still need to figure out a lot of these questions. So I'm certainly not getting people trying to promote the idea that everyone needs to follow a model of eating like this. And again, certainly not to the point if it was going to undermine any of the other fundamental things that make a bigger impact of your general food choices and the amount you're going to consume and so on. Awesome. No, I think um, we should turn you into Danny, the body, the body clock guy. I don't mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. That's actually good. The body clock guru. Yeah. New Instagram handle, I think. Yeah. Done. yeah. You have to change that. Sigma's done and dusted. Yeah, the body That's clock guy. The body, body clock, clock guru. guru. <laughs> <laughs> now, Danny, thank you very much for coming on, man. Really you, appreciate man. Yeah. it as yeah. always. Enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to watching the presentation uh, in the coming days and we'll speak to you very soon. Yeah, thank you, man. Enjoyed it. Thank you.